Welcome back to Eschatology Matters. I'm your host, Josh Howard, and I am uh, joined today by Dr. David Schrock. So, David, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you here. It's good to be on the show, brother. Um, David, if you're not familiar with uh, <clears throat> if you're not familiar with David Schrock, um, David holds a PhD from the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Um, you serve as pastor and preaching of preaching and theology. And I'm trying to get this right. Occoquan Bible Church in Woodbridge, Virginia. You nailed it. That's it. Yes. Practice makes perfect. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, at Occoquan Bible Church, um, you're also a founding faculty member at Indiana, uh, Indianapolis Theological Seminary. But where I was familiar with uh, with you, David, was from from two books that you released. Number one, mm -hmm. um, you released The Royal Priesthood and the Glory of God. And that mm -hmm. was in the Short Studies in Biblical Theology series, which is such a solid series. If, if Agreed. Yep. Yep. Very, very good. Um, I just I can't say enough about that series. I've, I've got I've got them on my shelf right here. Love those those books. So Royal Priesthood, Glory of God. We'll probably press in on that one in a minute. Sure. Um, but you also had Brothers. We are not plagiarists through Founders Press. Mm -hmm. which was a timely, timely work. Yep. Um, yeah, and, and that one was, of, of course, you, you know, you were responding to the, you know, the plagiarism kerfuffle and a lot of the controversy that surrounded that. But this was kind of a a, a, a plea toward pastoral. Well, I mean, you you go ahead and describe it for us, David, if you would. get What was the kind of recap on that if somebody's not familiar with that book? Yeah, so certainly there's a sense in which the issues with the Southern Baptist Convention, Ed Litton as the president of the SBC a couple of years ago, coming out with the fact that many of the messages that he had preached were, you know, borrowed in part and in whole from, from other pastors and got permission to do that. So there was defense of what he was doing. Um, but the book is not just kind of, you know, to, to rail against that, but what is it that we're doing when we are preaching? Uh, and why is it necessary that we're not just good public communicators, but actually students of the word of God to be able to preach the word of God, that that is even the qualifications found in First Timothy 3. And then because all of us would say none of us are original to what we're bringing to the pulpit, we learn from the scriptures and we learn from those who taught us the scriptures. What is a an ethical and a right way of doing that? And so really trying to make a positive argument for how we are to preach the word of God in that way. Right. No, excellent. I Just Sunday, I was I was quoting... Uh, you know, obviously the 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 often quoted John Knox, where he said that he uh, fears not the devil, but he trembles when he enters the pulpit. Mm -hmm. um, and it's such yeah. an encouragement to pastors to think in those regards. I think it's a, a that was a timely a timely appeal. W walk us into though, David, a little bit on eschatology. Um, you well, I don't want to I don't want to I don't want to say you're just a biblical theology guy, but a lot of your sure. stuff is fed into a kind of biblical theology, which in my mind, if we're looking at whole Bible eschatology. Mm -hmm. It is intertwined with biblical theology, but what's oh, yeah. been your experience of eschatology? Um, you know, whether in the academy, um, you know, coming through academic sure. studies, or or as a pastor in the church, how, how have you encountered theology or eschatology in your ministry? Yeah, uh, so I think just to begin with, as you said, it's something that begins in Genesis, goes all the way to Revelation. Uh, when I'm teaching eschatology in the classroom, one of the points that I want to make is that eschatology begins in the Bible before soteriology. Right, that there's a plan and a purpose from the very first commands to have dominion over the earth, to be fruitful, multiply, that what God has put in the beginning, sometimes it's known as protology, right? The study of first things, that in that very beginning there is an end in mind. Right. And so we can see in passages like Isaiah 46 that the Lord is the one who declares the end from the beginning. Right. He knows every single thing that he has decreed that is there. And so from the beginning, there's this goal towards the end. Uh, and of course, that is, you know, run into the ground immediately. Uh, as Adam sins, and there's a need for salvation uh, that comes at that point in time. And so the, the plan of redemption begins Genesis 3, uh, or at least is revealed in Genesis 3 at that point. Uh, but I want people to see that eschatology is not just the study of last things uh, that's pushed all the way to the end, uh, mm -hmm. but really it is the study of first things towards uh, last things. And so it really does go hand in hand with biblical theology and some of the Kind of the the your hardest Voss in the Dutch tradition has probably been most helpful uh, to think through biblical theology, eschatology, and many who have benefited from that, and then shared that with the church with us today. Yeah, no, solid, and I'm so glad you combined eschatology and protology. That the two, yeah, combining those two together. You you mentioned Voss, and usually we mm -hmm. do this toward the end, but I'm just going to go ahead and, and and jump in here. Um, you mentioned Voss, but who else are you pulling on? Because you mentioned teaching. Who else are you pulling on for that kind of whole Bible, big story eschatology? Like, where would people be looking for that sort of a theme? Yeah, so when I went to seminary, uh, the the book that was assigned, let's say, from 2004 to 2014 at Southern Seminary was According to Plan by Graham Goldsworthy. 
Good. Uh, and if, you know, you're one in an introduction to biblical theology, that's probably where I would start. And he has a handful of different versions and volumes that he's working on. The Gospel of the Kingdom would be one of those, Gospel and Revelation, Gospel and Wisdom, kind of the, the Goldsworthy trilogy that is there. Um, but he certainly was one that was deeply influential uh, in my thinking, in my understanding, reading the Bible there. And then probably as well, Steve Wellham, uh, who is both my professor. He's a Sunday school teacher for me. He was also a professor at Southern. And uh, the idea of progressive covenantalism and the works that he's done, both with Peter Gentry and Kingdom Through Covenant, and then the smaller version, God's Kingdom Through God's Covenants. Uh, and then also on top of that, the progressive covenantalism volume that had a number of different essays that were there. Uh, uh, those have been the most uh, helpful for me to put the Bible together. Okay, yeah, very good. And and for those, if if they're keeping up, progressive covenantalism that was that was a sequel work then to Kingdom through Covenant, essentially, right? A kind of a, a smaller um, elucidation of some of those points that were made in the larger volume. Yeah, in some ways it was topical, right? He was taking certain themes that are there. So someone like John Mead was writing on the issue of circumcision and tracing that through the scriptures. Uh, you have someone like Brent Parker who is working on the church Israel typology and that. And there's actually another progressive covenantalism volume in the works. Uh, so that may come out in another year or two that's just taking a few more of those ideas and pressing out this uh, understanding of the covenants. It's kind of, when I say, kind of an exegetical understanding of the covenants and how that applies to other various uh, doctrines and um, ethical applications. So so you so you mentioned having uh, Steve Wellum as your Sunday school teacher, which is, yeah. which is an awesome scenario to me. Um, how have you experienced this in, in the local church? Es eschatology for a lot of people, and we've 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 had a lot of these conversations, but eschatology for many, there was there was the wall charts that were quite confusing and intimidating. There was the um, I, don't, I don't know how old you are, but I'm assuming you might be from my generation where we grew up yeah. with, you know, particularly scary movies and the front covers were always red and it was terrifying. Mm -hmm. So for a lot of people, eschatology, there it left a bad taste. How have you experienced that in the local church um, as far as trying to teach that? Yeah. So, I mean, so I've served in two churches. One was in Southern Indiana and the church I'm in now is in Northern Virginia, just outside of DC. And they have different kind of, um, kind of theological backgrounds, um, some overlap. Uh, but the first was far more dispensational, I would say. And even when I went to that church, I was pre-millennial at that point in time. Uh, and if I had gone there as an Amil, which is where I was at the end of that time, they're just through studying the scriptures, that probably would have been uh, not well received at that point in time, just because I think that's often misunderstood or there's a confusion that is there. Uh, and certainly it seems that there's a denial of the millennium and what you find right. in Revelation 20. And I think there's a real interest in that. And really that's because the popular eschatology for the last hundred years or more uh, has really been this idea of dispensational pre-tribulation um, you know kind of rapture movies as you're talking about there uh, mm -hmm. my wife grew up in, in a church like that and they they love the bible they love the gospel they they were faithful to to their understanding the scriptures but they would have a real deep emphasis on that uh, and so there was always in that first church just kind of a, a desire for more of that sort of teaching um, and I've always said my, my mom is one who has always said so what are you going to preach revelation and, and I've said you know it's not until I've preached Isaiah and Daniel, right. and Ezekiel, and Zechariah, and all of those, because I think when you read uh, Revelation as it's been taught, it's like, okay, well, let's compare this to the various things in our world today. Uh, but it's far better to read Revelation by going back to the Old Testament and saying, how is John dipping his um, in his quill in the Old Testament and writing this vision that he has? So he's given a vision from the Lord. Uh, at the same time, he's using the Old Testament to explain the images that are there. And, and that's the direction that we need to go. And so for me, it's just teaching through the Bible to help us to understand that. Now, when I came to the church here, uh, I would say that one of the challenges that we faced was even seeing Christ in all the scriptures. And so you asked the question, how has eschatology worked out? Well, there was a, a real challenge that we had a couple of years in when we got here, because I'm committed to preaching Christ from all the scriptures, not, you know, every button hook and every little thing that is there in the tabernacle, but the tabernacle and the furniture that's there is leading us to understand something of Christ, who is the temple of God. And, and so preaching Christ from the Old Testament really was not well received by a number uh, in our church. And so we had a number of different challenges to think through. It's like, okay, how much of the Bible points to Jesus? 
Jesus. And, and thankfully, our elders came to us and say, well, all the Bible is about Jesus. Uh, and so on our elder board, we have, you know, pre-millennial and ah-millennial. I don't think we have any post-mill, uh, but pre-mill and ah-mill. And we can agree on the central factors of eschatology in the resurrection of Christ, the ascension of Christ, that all scripture is leading to that point. Uh, and that's been helpful to unify us as a church. Yeah. Whereas for a season, there was really kind of division that was there because some would read the Old Testament and say, well, this is about Jesus and this is about Israel. Uh, and I want to say Jesus is the true Israel and therefore all things are, are filtered through him and then applied to us. Mm, no, that's really helpful. And it's it's a story that, you know, it's it's unique. And yet at the same time, there's there's so many elements in that story you just told that sound familiar, right? Because because mm -hmm. I think for a lot of a lot of churches, there was a time in which the dispensational premillennialism was it was kind of the shibboleth, right? Like this was the way of kind of guarding orthodoxy. There's Protestant liberalism. We, we could go through that whole history. And yet at the mm -hmm. same time, now seeing a sort of conciliatory, not glossing over differences or anything or, and not sacrificing scripture, being serious about what we believe. And yet still, like you just said, serving together. It seems like there's a lot more of that in the local church these days than maybe 10, 15, 20 even years ago. Yeah, I think so. And, and I think if there's a right understanding of theological triage, right? So, I mean, Al Mohler has, you know, helped us with that language of theological triage and Christian maturity to recognize that the millennial position is not a first order issue. Uh, it's a it's a third order issue, right? And you can have debate and disagreement on texts in the scripture. That's a healthy place to be because it also challenges us to love one another, to forbear with one another. I mean, it's good to know some of the history, right? I mean, one of the reasons why the, the various uh, millennial views were assigned to first order was because the liberals were amillennial or, you know, even the social gospel was post-millennial. There's a whole history to that as well. Uh, and so those who held to an Inerrancy coming out of the modernist fundamentalist um, uh, debate uh, would certainly say, well, here's one way, as you said, a shibboleth. One way we know that you believe the Bible is the inerrant word of God is that you do believe in this particular eschatology. Uh, and I think moving from that, I realized, no, you can have different views on particular aspects of eschatology and still hold to the, in, the authoritative and inerrant word of God. Yeah. David, walk us a little bit into... Um, royal priesthood and we'll we'll connect this to eschatology a little bit more directly yeah. in a moment but um you've written on royal priesthood that was in your short study um that you wrote and if i'm not mm -hmm. mistaken that was also like the lion's share of your doctoral work um with your dissertation uh walk us in give us a little overview of what does royal priesthood look like in the bible and specifically how, how have you kind of brought that uh to bear yeah so yeah, there are multiple ways to kind of get into that. So with my dissertation, that's what I did, looking at a biblical theology of the priesthood, answering the question related to how does that relate to definite atonement, um, right? And so I had a question about definite atonement and felt that coming to an understanding of a biblical typology of the priesthood and the priesthood related to the covenant, especially the new covenant, leads to a definite atonement. Now, a couple years later, after finishing that, came to writing the short studies volume and said, how do we just trace this out? Because in so many ways, uh, the, the theme of priesthood, we may see it in Hebrews. Uh, we certainly know that Christ is a priest. There's a priesthood of believers. But oftentimes it's a sign that kind of a real focus on the priesthood is something that Roman Catholics do. Uh, okay. It's something that is, you know, not what Protestants do. And yet one thing that helps us to see how the whole Bible works together is the fact that Adam, when he was put into the garden, was put into a place of, of a garden sanctuary, and that he functioned there as a priest. Uh, one of the ways we know that is just the way that the language of to cultivate and to keep or to, to serve and to guard, we see that in Genesis 2.15, is coming from the language of Numbers 3 and Numbers 8 and Numbers 18, uh, where the Levitical priests, well, back up a second, where the Levites were told to do those very things. Those two words together, those verbs, show mm -hmm. kind of a priestly connotation. Um, and so just kind of beginning there and seeing that there's a whole pattern of the way that Noah serves in a priestly way uh, as he is offering sacrifices, and this is pleasing to the Lord. Uh, Abraham uh, functions as a priest uh, in the way that he's offering sacrifice in Genesis 22. Uh, in fact, it's striking that Melchizedek, who is kind of the, the, the chief understanding of a royal priest before you come to Israel, is both kind of looking back at Adam, 
who has, well, I mentioned priesthood, but has royal themes as well, where he is uh, given dominion over the earth. And of course, Melchizedek comes and he is the, the king priest from Salem, who is there, who offers bread and, and wine to Abraham. And what's striking about this, this man whose name means the king of righteousness, who serves as the, the king of, um, of peace there in Salem, is that we begin to see how Abraham takes up the mantle of Melchizedek. And this is a point that I bring out in the book. Uh, and the fact that the next place that we see the language of righteousness being used is in Genesis 15, right after Melchizedek blesses Abraham, where Abraham believes God and it's credited to him as righteousness. Mm. Right? A couple of chapters later, we see that in Genesis 17, that um, God promises Abraham that he's going to have sons who will be princes. There's the, a kingly element that is there. That's going to be developed ultimately through Judah and then to David and the rest. Uh, and then we come to uh, Abraham, who is called not to murder his son, but to offer him as a sacrifice. Right? And so in these next few chapters, it seems as though without saying that Abraham is a priest or even a priest king, uh, that he's taking up the mantle of Melchizedek. And I think that's one of the ways we're going to continue to see Melchizedek just kind of floating in the background of the Old Testament until David will come along and say something to the effect that he looks to his son and the Lord said, my Lord, sit at my right hand. You will be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. That's in Psalm 110. Uh, and so there's this whole storyline of royal priesthood that's going through. Israel gets that picked up as they're a kingdom of priests, and you will have the Levites who are then serving. Um, well, this is one confusion that I try to spell out in the book, is that the priests are not the Levites. Uh, the priests are the sons of Aaron. They're the ones who are brought near uh, to the Lord. The Levites are then added to be assistants to their brothers, the, the Aaronites, if you will. Okay. Uh, and so there's an establishment that is there. And ultimately, we're going to see someone like David who comes and even though he's not a priest, he's going to act in priestly ways. Uh, and we see that through him wearing the ephod as he brings in the, the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. And as he does that, he's dancing before that with the ephod that he got from uh, the house of the priest. And so he's going to establish a priesthood there. The prophets begin to promise in the future that a priest king is going to come like Psalm 110. Jesus comes and he's not named a priest in the Gospels, but he does a number of things that priests do. Right. Uh, even when a leper is brought to him uh, and he cleans him, he heals him, he, he, he makes him well. Well, that's what they did with the priest in the Old Testament. They would bring mm -hmm. the lepers and they would adjudicate. And now you have a better priest because he's able to heal them. Of course, he goes to the cross and he dies in our place, offering up a sacrifice for us, taking it back up again. And then he makes us a kingdom of priests through union with Christ, through the spirit he pours out upon us. So, I mean, we're just kind of skipping through the, the scriptures, but that's what I'm trying to show in the book of how this theme is so important for knowing who Christ is, for knowing who the church is, for knowing who we are today. Okay. No, that's super helpful. And that's a good grief. That's a huge view you're taking. And I'm trying to think just to just to kind of frame our thinking, who else is writing in this area? Because while you were talking, I'm kind of thinking of I'm obviously Greg Beal and T.D. Alexander, maybe James Jordan. There's, there's been other guys that have written on kind of the temple motif, but I'm trying to mm -hmm. think that priestly function. Who were you drawing on or in conversation with during that work? Yeah, great question. So um, Beal and T.D. Alexander do a great job with the temple, and they also mention the priesthood, right, in kind of not accidental ways, but it's not the primary focus that is there. Their focus has typically been on the temple, and by necessity, you have priests in the temple. Um, and so I would say Peter Lightheart and James Jordan, so James Jordan and then kind of his disciple, Peter Lightheart, have done a great deal with this, uh, have been really helpful. So reading some of those things uh, along the way has been helpful. Um, Scott Hahn is another person who has done a lot of this. Uh, he is someone who trained under Meredith Klein uh, and would be very much like G.K. Beale, except he became a Catholic. Uh, so he's been a Roman Catholic for 20 plus years, maybe 30 years or so. Uh, and so he's writing from that perspective. And so he has a book called uh, kinship, excuse me, uh, kinship through covenant. So not king, not the kingdom of God through covenant, uh, but kinship through covenant. Uh, and he has a whole section there on Levitical priesthood and eventually he's going to make an apology for the priesthood of Rome uh, and that understanding, which I think is where he goes too far. Uh, so he's really helpful in lots of ways, but then you can see he's making that apologetic. 
Um, one of the things that he does that most people are not doing, though, is taking into consideration the, the Levitical covenant. Uh, so the Levitical covenant is named in Malachi 2, probably comes from Numbers 25 when Phineas uh, stands up and makes atonement for the people as they're sinning against God at Baal Peor. Uh, and that's a covenant that I think is solidifying the, uh, the covenant with Israel. Uh, and we should keep that in mind because it seems as though the Levitical covenant and the Davidic covenant are going to be brought along in time until they're fulfilled both in Christ and the new covenant that he brings. Okay. No, that's super helpful. Thank you for, for walking through those. Um, so you, you're, you're bringing us up through this. And, and like you said, I think it's appropriate, right, to walk through the Old Testament context, um, Genesis all the way up through Christ. And you got to Christ and we're looking forward. Um, what's kind of that teleological or directional flavor then of of priesthood? How do you see that? And if, if you can't tell, I'm trying to strong arm this toward an eschatological statement. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, as we're looking toward eschatology, though, like I can see some connections there. But how how is that kind of moving us toward an eschatological understanding? Yeah, so uh, I think the ascension is one of the most important aspects for us to get a right eschatology. And if you go back to uh, just the debates over the last century or so with regards to dispensationalism and, you know, covenant theology and all the rest, one of the things that's often been under, un, not underscored, but just undervalued is the ascension. If you have a right understanding of the ascension, it's going to change the way that you understand the cosmology of the world today, eschatology as well. If he is reigning and ruling at the right hand of God, as Psalm 110 says that he is and being fulfilled in his ascension, then that's going to change the way that you're thinking about what age are we in, what are we to be expecting, all the rest. And so the priestly aspect of this is important uh, because um, there's a sense in which Christ could not be a priest on the earth because he was not from the line of, of Levi. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's something that, that Hebrews picks up, Hebrews 8, 4. And this is one argument of why people will say that Christ could not be a priest in the Gospels, because he can only be a priest in his ascension. Say, well, it's a little bit more fine-tuned than that, right? Because in the Old Testament, the sons of God were the ones who were the firstborns. The firstborn sons were the priests. So this gets passed on down from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob. You even have young men who are around the altar there in Exodus 19, Exodus 24. So it seems as though that priesthood is attached to sonship. But of course, the law comes and it changes that. You even have the firstborn sons who are redeemed by the Levites. And so when Christ comes, he doesn't identify himself as a priest according to the law, but he proves himself to be the true son of God. And with true sonship comes true priesthood and true kingship. And those three things are together. They're together there in Hebrews. And so when he is resurrected, he is declared the son of God. When he is raised to the right hand of God, he is receiving his priesthood. He now lives to intercede for us. And so this is one of the reasons why I think Psalm 110 uh, is the, the quickest way to get to all millennialism, right? So that's that's the position that I hold, that if Christ is seated at the right hand of God, he is now sending forth his word into the world to do two things, to save his people, which you see in Psalm 110, verses 2 and 3, and then to bring judgment on the nations, which you see in verses 5 through 7. And so as Christ is seated in glory, he's at work on the earth, all those things under his feet, he's given that authority, and now he's bringing those things to bear wherever the word and the spirit and the church of Jesus Christ goes. And I think that's going to be what we're seeing in this age as the gospel of the kingdom advances and also receives opposition and blowback as the, we can say it this way, as Satan and his minions are thrown down from their position on high, they're now raised on the earth that is here, right? And as they are doing that, there is a cosmic warfare that is going on that's not awaiting some day in the future, but rather that's the warfare that's going on today. Right. Very helpful to think of. And and especially with, I'm glad you mentioned there at the end, that as the kingdom expands and as the kingdom advances, that there is a vicious blowback. I think for a lot of Christians, that's of immense pastoral help uh, to think of a defeated enemy and yet an enemy that's thrashing all the fiercer because he is on his heels. That's right. Um, so I'm glad you I'm glad you brought that in. T tell me this. So there was for those of us who uh, are for some reason on Twitter, although you post really encouraging things on Twitter, which I'm, I'm grateful yeah. for. Um, that's that's not all of Twitter. But there, there's been there was a, a thing making the rounds on Twitter and it was, you know, your dissertation in five words or something like that. Mm -hmm. you, you came back with it was the follow up of that. And it was if you wrote your dissertation today and I'm going to quote this to make sure and I'm gonna ask you to, to kind of lean in on this and tell us what you meant by this. Um, you said if you wrote your dissertation today that it would be, quote, a biblical theology of royal priesthood 
is the key or as the key for binding and loosing church and state, end quote. Um, what, what were you kind of leaning toward on that one? Walk us into that a little bit, David. Yeah, so that's just an invitation. I'd love to go study that for three years, right? I mean, that's what a <laughs> dissertation is, right? You can go and look at these things. That's right. Um, yeah, so I think the royal priesthood is something that we can see running through all of Scripture. And one of the things that is joined together in the Old Testament is you have church and state in the nation of Israel, right? It is a theocracy that is there. God is their king, and they are to rule according to it. Now, they don't do it very well, right? The priests are constantly failing in that. The kings are failing in that. But they are brought, brought together. When you come to the New Testament, you have a separation of church and state in as much as to say the sword is now given to the state, Romans 13, and the keys of the kingdom are given to the church. Both those things, I would say, were held together in Israel before, uh, and now they're being separated out. But that doesn't mean that the church is priestly and that the state is kingly. Uh, I would argue something much more like that the church continues to be a royal priesthood that is worshiping and serving the Lord as it is gathered together. But it should also be training its members of the church to go and have dominion over the earth. Right. And so this is where I begin to make a distinction between what the church gathered does and what the church scattered does. Uh, and one of the things the church gathered does is certainly to worship and to uh, to display on the earth the, the resurrected lordship of Christ. We do that every single Sunday, first day of the week. Um, but it should also be training those who have come to faith in Christ to prepare them to go into the classroom, to go to the firehouse, to go to be a mom, to go into public office. So now they're taking a Christian worldview. They're taking, you know, the lordship of christ and they're applying that to every place that they go um and so i think that's one of the ways that the royal priesthood takes place because again you come to first peter chapter two and you see the fact that peter is naming uh, the church as a kingdom of priests so a holy a chosen race a holy nation those things that were said of israel are now of the church Okay. Now, on the other side of that, you also have the state, right? And so there's certainly elements of the state that could be brought through the Noahic covenant and the separations of different nations that came uh, at Babel. There's a whole um, kind of history to kind of trace out there. Uh, but it seems as though the state has this rule of, of authority that is to be able to exercise the sword, to punish evildoers, and to promote what is good. Um, and so I have some some thoughts on how that is working out. And I'd like to think more deeply about how that is to, to be played out um, in our world today. Yeah, no, and and that's fair enough, because I think for a lot of Christians, that's where the, the kind of rubber is meeting the road is um, many of us recognize that there is an element that that our discipleship extends beyond the walls of the church house, which is which is excellent. And kind of like you said, going into the world. Um, not taking by the sword, but instead um, a functioning of the kingdom. And yet it comes down to the the enforcement of law and who is to determine the goodness or evilness of that law. L let me ask you to define terms, though. Um, you mentioned theocracy. Um, just just a kind of brief walk through theocracy, theonomy. These terms get thrown around. I'm not asking you to define Christian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that one, you know, we would need another interview just to walk oh, through the definitions. But as far as theocracy, theonomy, general, yeah. general brushstrokes. Yeah, so it's hard for me to answer that question without thinking what I was just listening to. I was listening to James Jordan respond to Greg Bonson. Uh, and Jordan is defining himself as a theocrat and pointing at uh, Bonson as a theonomist. And it seems as though, I mean, so Bonson's been dead many years, but he still continues to be deeply influential on those things. It has, has lots of good things, especially as apologetics. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things we see is that, you know, that theonomy seems to be associated so much with Greg Bonson. And okay. so just defining terms today, I think you say, okay, different people are speaking of the way that God rules, the way that God uses his law, the way that we are to apply his law in so many different ways. You really have to get into the details of that. And so I'm not sure I can give a, a one size fits all for those definitions. Okay. Right. If just to focus on the etymology of theonomy, right. So certainly it's God's law. Uh, and we certainly want to say, yeah, that's something uh, that we want to to see uh, done. We don't want, you know, a pagan law. We don't want a worldly law, secular law. So certainly there's a sense in which we would want God's law to be applied. And that's where the question comes is, and so how is it applied? Right. Uh, I think it's important to realize that all that God has given to us, so this is just basic 2 second, second Timothy 3, uh, 16 and 17, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful. Right. And so everything that we find in the Old Testament has an ongoing use today, 
And for me, I would see it as ongoing use for, for wisdom. Uh, that as the Old Testament, each of those covenants, so this goes back to you know, something that's been teased out by Peter Gentry and Steve Wellman of progressive covenantalism. They're looking at the different covenants as typological of the new covenant. I would see something similar, uh, that those covenants, especially the, the law covenant with Israel, is something that gave law to that nation, that the nations around it would learn wisdom from them, and it seems as though that the nations in world history have learned from the Hebrew scriptures. I mean, certainly even something like um, Yoram Hazani makes this point in his book on conservatism, that the impact on English law came from the Hebrew scriptures. So there has been wisdom that has been applied there, and some can be made more applicable than others. Mm -hmm. I say there's goodness in that. Um, but that's still different than saying that just as Israel was God's nation, so we need to have a Holy Roman Empire, or we need to have America as a covenant nation with God. Mm. That's not something that I'd be comfortable saying from Scripture. Yeah. So you're, you're saying you find a general equity there in the uh, the Old Testament, if I can? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Speak some words in there for you, David. <laughs> that's right. That's no, right. Um, no, I'm tracking with you. And it, it, it is difficult because I think for a lot of, and it's been helpful to a certain extent that uh, you're starting to see people write and think deeply on this, as you as you mentioned, you guys are doing just to delineate at least what are we talking about? What are the parameters of these terms? Um, it's never helpful when you're talking past one another. Let me, let me ask you this, and this, honestly, David, this might be a little bit too much to bite off, but just in general, you've mentioned uh, progressive covenantalism. Obviously, Gentry Wellam, theirs was kind of like one of the definitive works on progressive covenantalism. And so if we're looking on that kind of uh, you know, spectrum and correct me here, Dave, uh, David, if I misrepresent this, but kind of on that big spectrum of continuity versus discontinuity, progressive covenantalism is going to be looking at more continuity than discontinuity, and yet still not as much continuity as maybe we could say traditional covenant theology, um, as far as Old to New Testament covenants and how they work out within that redemptive plan of God. Is that impacting this? And again, I know you're writing on this. So mm -hmm. if you want to punt to like what you guys are thinking toward when you're writing, that's fine, too. But uh, is that impacting this conversation? Because typically it seems that most of the time within covenant theology, you'll find more Presbyterian flavor. Within pro progressive covenantalism, you'll find a lot more of a Baptist flavor. Is that playing into this kind of conversation? Well, I think it is. Um, it, it, so there are multiple things going on here, right? So, I mean, I think so much conversation is happening today. Uh, and I can only speak of my own experience at Southern Seminary. Um, but I think it might be general across the board that there wasn't much training, teaching, um, discussion of political theology, public theology 10, 15, 20 years ago in seminaries. Right. Um, and part of that was we're just coming out of a history in our country where that was just sort of assumed um, that there's just kind of a Judeo-Christian flavor to the country and certainly the impact that has had there. There wasn't as much need for that. Certainly post the Burgerfeld, there's been a huge need for that. Right. And it's not to say that that wasn't there, right? I mean, um, Francis Schaeffer saw that, right? When R.C. Right. Sproul asked him about what's the, the one thing that you see that's concerning statism was the answer. So he was, you know, prescient in some of the things that he saw, right. right? So I think that we're having these conversations and then we're having to have them through the various traditions that are there. Uh, and certainly systems of biblical theology are going to play a massive role uh, in that, right? So what Gentry and Wellam have done, I think sometimes it's, a, well, they kind of did a, a via media, and they use that language, which I think is unhelpful at times, but, you know, between covenantalism and dispensationalism. But I think the thing to know about their entire project was they were always seeking to be just exegetical about it. Um, and so even the language of continuity, discontinuity, it's good shorthand for kind of comparison, contrasting, but it's not something that we find in scripture, right? Where scripture is not giving us continuity, discontinuity, that's kind of language we're using to kind of describe what's going on there. But allowing scripture to give its own terms, uh, I think is what they're trying to do there and why they are just um, vehement to define uh, covenant uh, with the terms of the scripture. And recognizing that covenant theology, and then you have kind of a Presbyterian variety in Westminster, and you have a Baptist variety of, of covenant theology in the Second London Confession. And I think in those, um, you know, they're using the term covenant theologically. And of course, there's there's reason for doing that. And what Wellman and Gentry tried to say, we need to go back and say, what does scripture mean when it uses that term? Uh, and so that's why they would be more comfortable with a plan of God that is administrated through multiple covenants that ultimately lead to the new covenant that is there. And so, yeah, so one of the things that Christ overall, that's one of the ministries that I'm a part of, is trying to do is to kind of flesh out some of these ideas in the public square 
with a rigorous progressive covenantal understanding of, of the Bible. Okay, very good. Yeah, one of the things that, that Gentry and Wellam's book, I always appreciated, uh, agree or disagree with their conclusions, you can appreciate the exegetical honesty, trying to walk through those passages, trying mm -hmm. to do the hard work. And that's why, you know, obviously, uh, how long was the first one? I read the first one, then they came out with the abbreviated one, and I, I felt shorted because, you know, I'd work through, <laughs> no, um, but it's a, but it's a helpful walk through. Like I said, agree or disagree with them, it's helpful regardless, just to walk mm -hmm. through those passages. Um, David, so you were mentioning kind of the uh, the current state that we're in, um, COVID happened, um, and a lot of churches had to maybe exercise muscles that they had not previously exercised and think about church-state relations in a way they hadn't previously. Um, and now we're kind of seeing this resurgence in, or I don't know about resurgence, we're seeing a um, a current conversation regarding Christian nationalism and, and all these things. And obviously we can see um, reasons in our culture and we could walk through those. But just in general, you, you uh, let me refer to one other tweet that you had made. Um, you were talking about the kind of current vitriol uh, concerning uh, post-millennialism, theonomy, and Christian nationalism in that debate. And it's been, there's been a lot of vitriol. There's been some calm voices. There's been some louder voices that have been, that have been less calm. Um, but you said that we were living off the proceeds in many ways in the Christian church in America specifically, I think is what you're referring to, but living off the proceeds of previous generations and specifically the cultural stability that was built by Christians. And you included Puritans, which I was, I was really thankful for. Um, mm -hmm. Walk us into that because I, I feel like that paints a very, uh, understandable and very prescient picture that we are living off proceeds of what has come before. And now we're grappling with not only what was built and how was it built, but what are we to build in the aftermath? Um, could you walk us into that tweet just a little bit, David? Yeah, I think part of that was probably even just seeing some conversation where, you know, if you have conservative and liberal, maybe those aren't even the best terms, but you have those who are conservative are trying to conserve something. And Iraqi initially, what, what are we even trying to conserve today? Hasn't right. it just been, been lost? There's a need for building today. And I think there's something to that. And what I think what has been lost is a recognition of what was built in the founding generation of our country. And even before that, this is where the Puritans come in with kind of the Protestant work, the Puritan work ethic that is there that has just kind of shaped the, the nation from its very beginning. Um, that it was based on these ideas more than ethnicity, more than you know race, more than any of these other things. It's based on those ideas. Uh, and that has had a massive impact uh, on our country. And I think for for the good, um, because, you know, I just got done uh, listening to Mark David Hall's book on the founders. I can't remember the title of it, um, but he just makes the case to say that in the founding um, era, that Christianity uh, was certainly influencing the thought and the, the argumentation uh, at the Second Continental Congress and all the rest of the book that was quoted most at that time was the Bible, right? Mm -hmm. And so there was a general reverence for, appreciation for, even saw the need for uh, religion in our country. And so that's just very different than where we are today. And so I think churches have grown up over the last 200 years, let's say, in a space where they've been able to just enjoy the proceeds of the freedoms that were there laid out in our founders, founders who develop those uh, from even earlier times from, from Christian ideas. Uh, and if that's the case, um, we've lost, especially since the 1960s and the number of the changes that have been taking place in our culture and our country. Uh, and I think Christians have just kind of capitulated, mm -hmm. right? To say that if I'm going to have this job, I need to not talk about Christ in the public square. Uh, and so it does function in a more Rawlsian sort of way. John Rawls is talking about just a, you know, arguing that you can't bring your religion into the public square. We've just kind of assumed that. Uh, say, no, we really need to be able to do that. Uh, and, and so some want to take that and move towards a Christian nationalism, try to Christianize the nation. and say, well, we just need to define our terms really, really, really well, because uh, we certainly have benefited from the light that has come through the gospel, the secondary effects of the gospel in our country. Uh, and today, if we're losing that, then we as Christians need to, the hope and the mission of the church remains the making of disciples. But when those disciples are made, we need to train them and to teach them all the things that Christ has commanded us to send them into the world to be those who are spreading light into all those corners. The church gathered doesn't do that, uh, but the church is equipping those to vocationally spread the light into all those areas. And I think that's something that we are having to, th to think through. And there are different propositions on the table, uh, some with louder voices than others, some with more Bible than others uh, who are doing that. I think that's why we're having such uh, debates about these things. Yeah. So, I mean, I, and again, I, I know you're writing still, thinking through still a lot of these things, as we all are. But 
speaking of something as a Christian nation, then is that language that you would use at this point? Or is do you find that to be helpful language, a Christianized or Christian nation? Yeah, I just want to that is. Yeah, I mean, if I'm talking to someone, talking to you, I say, and what do you mean by that? Right? Right. How, how, how are you how are you defining that? Um, when you have someone who says that we don't need a majority uh, to be able to have kind of Christian principles or laws that are respective to to the word of God, as long as we have a really strong and vocal minority who's kind of pushing into the public spaces to do that, say, is that the best? Because that certainly seems to invite a kind of belligerence and even violence that would have just a small group to kind of radically take over and to coerce others in doing that. That doesn't seem to be the best way to go forward, at least if we're allowing uh, scripture and the principles that are there. So I think there's ongoing needs to be talking about these things. I mean, so for Christ overall, we have on our calendar in the month of October, a whole month that we're going to dedicate to Christian nationalism. The following month, we're going to be thinking about culture building. Uh, what are we to do with that? Um, because these are important conversations for us to have. And a lot of the, the debates are, are taking place on Twitter. Uh, and yeah, I mean, you can put together a thread there and it's kind of interesting and it gets a lot of you know eye attention. Um, but ultimately, we need something deeper and more foundational in the institutions that are going to be in local churches and then local churches in local communities and local communities that are going to have impact for uh, a broader nation. So uh, I'd want people to define what they mean by that. And I think we're getting some definitions there. Uh, right. And then to think through how can we be co-belligerents if we don't exactly agree on every single thing of, you know, post-millennial, amillennial, can we still work together or must someone be post-millennial to, to do these things? I think those are ongoing conversations. And the more that we can elongate those conversations through podcasts like this or through in-person meetings, I think the better off we'll be. Oh, that's good. And 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 in the back of my mind, as you were talking about that, and Christians, Christians then kind of a diffused kind of view of Christians bringing their faith into, because um, I can remember, I mean, obviously we can all remember probably the whole, uh, you know, the don't discuss politics and, and religion around the dinner table. And then we take that to our job, like you said, and maybe I don't need to speak about my job, but applying God's law because that that's what I heard from your tweet and help me if I'm I'm mishearing you but when I when I read that tweet and I just reflected on us kind of coasting on the uh the benefits of those who have come before us God's law applied in this country and in this culture um whether the culture was Christian or not we could debate but God's law being applied there the fact that there was laws that protected um that that admonished evil that rewarded good those type of things that we're now seeing uh not not revoked, but in many ways unraveling. I think I think that's a great place to to walk through that conversation with. Yeah, I think that's um, yeah. I mean, you, you see that right. I mean, where the administration, uh, the White House Biden administration right now, is taking things that are evil and trying to put them into to law. They are right. they are coercing uh, people to do wicked and terrible things, right? And, you know, certainly if you go back, you know, decades and centuries in our country and you go to, I'm not, I can't remember when the Supreme Court building was built, um, but, you know, I'm 20 miles from DC. So walk around that. I mean, there's Moses right on the outside of the Supreme Court, <laughs> right? right? I mean, so if we're thinking through, okay, we have to find laws. Well, a couple of things to think there, I mean, laws are always downstream from religion, right? I think anyone who thinks that you can have a purely secular, um, government secular understanding of community or culture that like, you can't right? right i mean so in the founding of our nation there was a sense which they didn't want to make at a federal level uh secretary uh, to make it sectarian they didn't have a problem with establishing religion in local states right most of the states had some form of um established church that was there but at the federal level they didn't want to do that uh you know you move a little bit further on and religious liberty was something that is in our country. Well, that's still true. It's just that the law of our land, or I should say the religion of our land, is sexual self-expression. Mm -hmm. And so you can have all the religious liberty that you want if you're pursuing the LGBT agenda. Uh, right. And I think, thankfully, there are Christians who are standing up to, to oppose that uh, and say, no, there really is a connection between the laws of the land and the religions of the land. Uh, and we need to think wisely how to do that. Right. Uh, and I think the, the place to do that is certainly the word of God. Um, but I'm not convinced that a theonomic way of doing that, we're applying the laws of Israel straight across directly to America. There's wisdom that is there, the standards that are there. So now we need to think through how do we apply that to ourselves today? And that's where conversation needs to continue. Yeah. And and kind of while you were describing that, I was thinking toward the I've, I've heard the phrase, the myth of neutrality. 
<laughs> far more in the last few years. And I think it's been a helpful, obviously there could be some abuses, but I think it's been a helpful retrieval of, um, we think of the social sphere or the governmental sphere or the sphere of laws. And we think of a, a kind of neutral, <laughs> um, you know, area in which uh, morality and, and religion don't creep in. And I think what you're bringing out is, is right on the nose that there is always a religion that underlies these things. There's always a spiritual component to these things. Mm-hmm. No law, people say don't legislate morality. All of all of laws are are are, are you know drawn from a moral impetus or a spiritual impetus. Um, I know we need to wrap up, David, and I want to be respectful of your time. Where do you see encouraging things? Because I, I view those as encouraging trends within Christianity, even with all the Twitter hubbub, um, the fact that we're talking about the myth of neutrality, the fact that we're talking about um, the legislation of morality, and it's not a matter of whether, but which, which morality will be mm-hmm. legislated, which laws will be, yep. what what will be deemed evil and what will be deemed good, um, because something will always be deemed evil and good. But what what are the encouraging trends you see right now? Um, what are some of the, uh, the, obviously you mentioned that there are some people that are, praise God, starting to write a little more and think a little more and speak a little more clearly as opposed to just Twitter, Twitter, but maybe sussing these ideas out. I see that as encouraging. Where do you see some encouraging areas of development in this area? Yeah, I mean, I think the place that it has to begin is not the trends that I see on, on the ground, but the fact that all things are under the feet of Jesus Christ. Mm. Right. I mean, the thing that will never change in any nation at any time is that Christ is raised from the dead. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. All things have been given to him. Everything is under his feet. Yeah. Right. And so whatever the next few trends, whatever the next few years or decades happen in our country, that doesn't change. Right. right? And so that should give us confidence and boldness then to proclaim the entire uh, canon of Scripture in the local church. Right, to, to preach with boldness there, to equip people to go and to do hard things. And then for those who are, you know, going out into the world doing those hard things to know that they're not alone in that. Right. Uh, that, that Christ is is reigning over all of that. And, you know, I think about what happened in COVID and, and watching. So again, I'm just outside of DC. Uh, so we have many members of our church who are members in the military. And a number of them, you know, not everyone did this, but a number of them were under the conviction not to take the, the COVID vaccine uh, that was mandated for them. And that meant for them that they could lose their careers, right? I mean, right. these are not, you know, early enlistees. These are guys, 20 years of military service with families and all the rest. And to out of obedience to Christ were, were for themselves were were saying I won't do that, and it gave them incredible opportunities to share Christ. Uh, God worked in in remarkable ways. Uh, the ones in our church did not lose their jobs, were not terminated, did not you know have a dishonorable discharge, uh, and their faith grew immensely uh, mm-hmm. in that. And it was great to see our church rally behind them. Uh, and to be able to help them to continue to stand for Christ in the public square and in their own jobs. And that was just uh, really encouraging. Yeah, no, that's so good. Um, David, I could keep talking for a while, brother. We might have to follow this up sometime if I can if I can weasel you back. Yeah, sure. Here. But um, David, where can people uh, follow you, keep up with your writing? Obviously, we mentioned Christ Overall, which is your ministry, but how, how can people best keep up with you and what you're doing? Yeah, I mean, so I'm a local church pastor, so I preach in uh, 20 miles south Washington, D.C. If anyone's coming through, they can certainly visit our church on a Sunday. Uh, I have a blog that uh, writes at davidschrock.com, and most of my energy these days on writing is with christoverall.com. So Christ Overall is something that uh, started with Steve Wellam and Ardell Candidate, Brad Green, Trent Hunter, a few other guys uh, back in the fall. Uh, and so that is something that we're continuing to take biblical theology and try to press that into the church, into all the corners of culture. So ChristOverall.com would be a good place to, to keep up with me. Perfect. Well, David, thank you so much for joining us, man. This has been really? encouraging and I appreciate you, brother. Yeah, I appreciate you, Josh. It's fun.